<sighs> Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. We aren't going to start just yet, we're just kind of getting ready and letting people sort of settle in and uh, find the quiz. Uh, we'll be starting properly at 8, um, I'll just be doing a little introduction about into university and talking about the situation a little bit first and then we'll be going into the quiz after about 10 minutes or so. So you've got plenty of time to uh, kind of get ready, get yourself a drink um, and we can start in a little while. Um, at the moment, please just forgive any technical problems that might be happening. It does it does happen now and again, so please don't worry about it. And we'll be starting very soon. Thank you very much, Richard. Very kind. Thanks for joining everyone. Just uh, refreshing everyone to say that we'll be starting in about seven minutes. Uh, so just make yourselves comfy for the time being. The video description does have a link to our fundraising page. So please do donate. We're doing really, really well towards our £5,000 target for the time being. Um, but every little helps very, very much. And we will be able to spend every penny to support our young people in such a difficult time. So we really appreciate all the donations, all the generosity we've already seen so far. So thank you so much for that. Uh, in the meantime, like I said, get yourselves a drink, find someone on your team to get the Google form ready, that's also in the video description. Uh, you don't all need to be on the Google form, you can just be doing that with one member of your team, uh, unless of course you're playing solo, um, which, you know, only, only truly dedicated quizzes will be, but that's what I'd be doing. Uh, but otherwise, in the meantime, just make yourselves comfortable, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Very much enjoying all the messages of support from lovely Inter University staff members. Such a nice organisation full of such lovely people, so very, very nice to hear so many nice messages coming through. Starting in just about five minutes, uh, like I said, we'll do a little introduction about Inter University first, and then we'll be going on to do the questions shortly afterwards. So we'll be starting probably around ten past eight, that's the, that's the goal. I apologise, by the way, if the thumbnail looks a bit weird. Uh, this is live, and I, I generally stream on Twitch when I stream, so it's a little bit odd doing it via YouTube, and despite dress rehearsals, desperately tried to get the thumbnail to be something I want it to be, and I keep trying, and it keeps just making it an invariant uh, inception photo of me over and over again. All I can say is, obviously, obviously YouTube thinks I'm, I'm good for the camera, but we can, we can only deal with that as, as we may. Hopefully it'll, it'll work in a moment. We'll just be starting in about five minutes.
I've also got my great um, supporting team who've uh, put this quiz together. I may be the face of it, but uh, Rebecca Marsh and Anna Milne have put a huge amount of work into this. Um, so please direct your gratitude towards them far more than me. I'm just I'm just a pretty face, unfortunately. But uh, the two of them have put a huge amount of effort into making this a fun and engaging quiz and really something to to, to talk about at a time like this. Cool, just about four minutes to go. We'll be getting started shortly. Uh, in the meantime, make yourselves comfortable, make yourselves at home, which is very easy at the moment because everybody is at home. If you're not at home, go home. Apparently my thumbnail's just been updated, so maybe we won't have a black hole of atoms anymore, which would be really great. Okay. Oh, hope everyone's doing well. I hope the hope the weather's not getting anybody down. I feel like we we were so close to summer. It was even I was enjoying it. I famously hate summer, but actually, it was it felt so real. I was having dinner outside, and then then it all it's all just it's all just gone downhill, and now it's been cold and raining, and and all, all I've got to do is watch is watch squirrels with pastry in my garden. I'll more on that later. I'll ex I'll explain what I mean there. It's very exciting though. It's very exciting. I never realised there was so much going on in my garden as I do now, but that's probably what happens when you're able to watch it for. 12 plus hours a day. Okay, we'll just be starting in a couple of minutes, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Thank you for tuning in if, you're, if you've just joined us. Uh, we'll be starting very soon. Very, very happy to see such a lovely number of messages coming in. Uh, I'm afraid I will be spending most of my time on the quiz, so uh, if you do leave messages in the comments, I will try and have a look, um, but I'll be, I'll be focusing mostly on the quiz. Um, I do have my excellent support team who will be sending me updates as well, though. So if you do have, um, particularly later on, if you've got questions about uh, maybe if you want me to repeat something, just put that in the comments and that will sort of filter through to me at some point, uh, hopefully, hopefully pretty quickly. Once again, many thanks to everyone who's already donated. We're doing really, really well towards our £5,000 target this evening. Uh, it's already been really great. We've seen so much generosity from everybody. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. And it does go such a long way towards uh, helping us support our young people. So thank you so much again for that. It's really, really great. Sorry, every time I do this, I'm still talking to my, my support team, but we're nearly there. Great. Well, it's nearly eight o'clock, so um, I will be getting started in just a moment. Once it turns eight, we'll get started. Uh, you'll still have plenty of time to get yourselves a drink and get the Google form open to visit the fundraising page. You'll have plenty of time for that. We won't be starting the actual questions until about ten past eight. So there's plenty of time to go and do anything you might want to do uh, in the meantime, as long as it's uh, ten minutes or less. So, you know, keep it. Don't, don't go out and have a picnic in the garden. Don't go and start reading a novel. That's not going to be time for that. But at the moment, we're doing well. OK, it is eight o'clock, so I'm going to get started. I'm a stickler for punctuality. Hello, good evening and welcome. Very, very warm welcome to the Inter-University, the first Inter-University virtual lockdown coronavirus 2020 quiz. Uh, my name is Adam Drew. Typically, I'm the Senior Data and Impact Officer for Inter-University. But this evening, I am your presenter. If you've come looking for Joe Wicks, I'm going to have to disappoint you. But you can think of me as the Joe Wicks of online quizzing. I don't know what that means, but hopefully it'll, it'll mean I'm, I'm a popular online quizzing host. Uh, I'm not keeping people fit, but I'm keeping people sharp. Maybe. Hopefully. I'm just going to spend a few minutes, though, talking about... Inter University's mission. I've been working for Inter University for over two years, and uh, this is a really good chance for us to just very briefly talk about what Inter University does and why what we're doing is so important at the moment, given the current situation. 
So to those of you who don't know, Inch University started back in 2002 uh, as a response to, at the time, quite localised educational underachievement in West London. But since then, we've spread into a very, very large national charity uh, tackling educational underachievement wherever we can find it. Our founders devised an integrated and long-term programme of academic and pastoral support, which we continue to this day. And particularly that pastoral support is a big uh, a big talking point for me this evening because that's that's such a big such a big factor in the support that we can provide to young people throughout a period like this. We've been providing an innovative program that helps young people raise their aspirations and broaden their horizons, and I've seen firsthand just how much of a difference it can make. And last year, uh, 69% of our school leavers achieved a place at university compared with just 24% of students on free school meals nationally, uh, and 38% of all students nationally. Uh, and why we're needed, this doesn't go without saying, because not enough people know about it. 1.1 million UK children receive free school meals, and they're 4.6 times less likely to go to university. They're 15 times less likely to go to a top university, and they're 55 times less likely to go to Oxbridge. And it's difficult to express educational injustice in a couple of statistics, because you're always going to miss uh, the human stories that are going on. You're always going to miss the disappointments, the missed potential and the people that suffer and who can't be expressed as a statistic. But I hope that just that gives you some impression of the scale of the challenge faced by educational work uh, tackling disadvantage in the UK. It really does make a difference. Our programmes encompass, this is a very simple uh, a very simple reduction of what we do, but it does cover the basics. We have academic support that we provide uh, for all students from both primary up to secondary. So we provide it from year, year threes and some year twos all the way up to year 13. So 17 and 18 year olds finishing school. We do this weekly. We do twice a week sessions for secondary students and two individual primary sessions for our younger students. And we're continuing to provide the support remotely to our students during this time. We also provide the Focus Programme, which is a long series of aspiration raising workshops all the way from year three in primary school, way, way up to year 13. Uh, we work with students throughout the entirety of their education to provide them with skills for the future, for building their aspirations and getting them excited about higher education, tackling barriers that might be academic, but also might be psychological, helping people who feel like they don't think they belong at university and we're here to help change their minds. We also provide a mentoring programme that's continuing very much at this time. We do uh, online mentoring at the moment and we have both university student volunteers and volunteers from our many corporate partners who provide a really, really essential role in helping our young people develop both their self-esteem and also their sort of technical skills and their soft skills when it comes to both finding employment and excelling academically. We provide a wide network of student enrichment activities for a varying, uh, varying range of ages. We provide work experience, networking opportunities. Our Big City Bright Future programme has been running for the last several years and has provided massive, massive opportunities for our young people in year 13 and above to get really, really great first um, uh, first hand work experience of working in big city firms like BlackRock, like UBS. Uh, a huge difference that it makes to uh, our really aspirational young people. I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about what we've been doing during this time, during the lockdown, because uh, it is obviously a massive change to our model and how we do things. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has necessitated the temporary closure of all inter-university centres. Uh, since the schools closed, we have been forced to close our centres, but we've been offering a remote service to all of our students using both telephone and online support. Something we found in surveying our students in the last couple of years was that a lot of our students have trouble at home in terms of having access simply to space that they can work in. A lot of our students live in quite overcrowded housing. They might live in housing that is very loud because they've got lots of siblings. They might have some duty of care over their younger siblings themselves. And it's not easy for them to do work, even in the best of times, in those environments. And so right now to be doing this alongside trying to have homeschooling, alongside families who, for whom Education might not be a priority at the moment. A lot of people are understandably facing a lot of financial pressure and pressure from simply mental health. So it's difficult to make education a priority sometimes. And that's what we're trying to help a lot of our students with. We're offering a remote service to our students using both telephone and um, email support and online support. We've been providing online learning platforms to our primary school students. Our students, uh, we found, are particularly vulnerable as well during the school shutdown and likely to fall further behind their peers at a time when they're already at a disadvantage educationally, as we know. This means that the support we can provide right now is a really important lifeline for the young people and the families uh, we work with. 
I have just been told by my support team, please don't post any answers in the comments. Uh, we can't turn the comments off. So please don't spoil any of the answers in the comments. Uh, and also, you're just disadvantaging yourselves because if you do that, it's just going to give other people the answers and then you're not going to win the prize. So, you know, think, think tactically, guys. Anyway, we just as a measure of some of the scale of the support we've been providing so far, on average, for the last few weeks, we've been providing a minimum so far of 2,500 calls to our families in lockdown. These are both pastoral calls and academic calls. We've been providing support to students in terms of just pastoral and welfare, checking in with people, seeing how they're doing, talking over people's, uh, potentially their anxieties, particularly with a lot of our older students dealing with their, uh, providing advice and dealing with their anxieties about maybe what's going to happen in September with the uncertainty regarding university, and also supporting our younger students with uh, directed learning and help with projects and just keeping themselves busy and providing a little bit more support to parents who, who might be finding it difficult to juggle everything at once at the moment. Having made this support, is, it's, it's been a massive transition to go from our current model to what we're having to do, uh, from our, sorry, our previous model to what we're having to do at the moment. And it makes a massive, massive difference to have donations at a time like this because we are having to adapt very rapidly to what's going on. And long term, we don't know what the future of this academic year and what the future of, of education is going to be like in this country at the moment. And so... We're really, really grateful to any support that you've been able to provide to us so far. We've had a really incredible, generous amount of donations so far. We're so grateful for that. We have got a target this evening of, of £5,000, so any donation you make is greatly appreciated. We're asking for maybe £5 per person at the moment in the quiz, um, but any donations made are deeply, deeply appreciated. And we're so grateful for everyone who's already donated. So thank you very much for that. It really means a great deal, and it means we can provide so much more support to our young people over this time. Right, I think we are just about ready to get going. I'm going to explain the format of the quiz first. Uh, we're going to have five rounds. There's going to be a short break after round three. Uh, short break after round three. We are going to be having um, some celebrity guest appearances. I don't want to give away too much at the moment because it is very exciting. Uh, you do need to be submitting your answers via a Google form. The link to that is in the description for the video. Please, uh, you don't need a Google form for every member of your team if you're playing in a team. Absolutely fine to just have the one. Um, so you only need to have one person submitting answers there. If for any reason, uh, any reason you're going to miss this, this video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and will be available until the 5th of May. And then uh, after which we will be announcing the winners, we'll be marking the quiz uh, in this in the time between now and the 5th of May. Um, so we're not going to be doing live answers. Uh, once you've submitted your answers via the Google Forms, we've finished off the quiz, we will then start marking. And like I said, we'll be announcing the winners by the 5th of May. Um, and you will have time to view uh, the video after it's been uploaded as well. Right, well, I think it's been enough yammering from me. You must feel like uh, uh, primary focus students because I've been talking at you for a really, really long time and the sound of my own voice gets really grating after a while. So I think it's about time to get started with the quiz. So let's get started with round one. Round one is our general knowledge round. I hope you're all ready. If everyone has got their Google Forms ready, please get started now. If you're struggling, then this is your last chance. I will be leaving little pauses between the questions, so I hope you have a bit of time to catch up. But without further ado, we're going to get going. Question one for the general knowledge round. The Ruby anniversary marks what year of marriage? Happy or not, what year of marriage is marked by the Ruby anniversary? Ruby anniversary marks what year of marriage? That is question one. Give you a couple of moments to fill that out on the Google Forms. Please, if you are having any trouble, do uh, say so in the comments and uh, my fantastic support team will be able to let us uh, deal with that. But please just say so in the comments and we can help you out. But that's question one. What year of marriage is marked by the Ruby anniversary? Question two. Which city is said to have been founded by Romulus and Remus? Part of this legend supposedly was that the two of them were suckled by a she-wolf that's very intense parenting. I don't know if that sort of thing is a prerequisite for founding cities, but whether or not can you identify what that city is? Romulus and Remus, according to legend, founded which city? Question two. Question three. Which zodiac sign is represented by this animal? In case the slightly odd graphic 
is unclear. This animal is a goat. This is a goat. Which animal is represented by a goat? And I appreciate in zodiac signs there are two. There is some lack of clarity sometimes in zodiac signs. This is a goat, not a ram. Uh, which zodiac sign is represented by this animal? Question three. Just give you a moment to do that and to catch up. I've got my water here. It's not gin, I assure you. It's a little bit early for that still. Question three, which zodiac sign does this animal represent? Question four, what do the numbers add up to on the opposite sides of a dice, or a die if you're being particularly pedantic? Now I don't mean what do the numbers on all the opposite sides add up to, what's the sum of all the numbers, that's not true. If you pick any two opposite sides of a dice, what do the numbers add up to? Question four, what do the numbers add up to on the opposite sides of a die or dice? Common usage though, right? Common usage, dice, everyone says dice. Sounds really weird to say die now, I wouldn't say die. Die's just odd. I'm not gonna say that. Dice, dice is fine. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Question four, what do the numbers add up to on the opposite sides of a dice? Question five, in the 2019 New Year's Honours list, which famous author was recognised for his fantasy trilogy, which was adapted by the BBC last year for television? Question five, in the 2019 New Year's Honours list, which famous author was recognised for his fantasy trilogy, which was adapted by the BBC last year? Question five. Getting lots of messages coming through of people watching the quiz, even with their families as well. It's really lovely to see that. Thank you so much, everyone who's tuning in tonight. I hope it's fun. I hope it's cheering you up on a, a really grey and miserable April evening. It's the 29th of April as well. Like, why is it so cold on the 29th of April? But it's really, really great to see so many people tuning in. I hope you're all having fun. I uh, hope you, again, lots of questions right. Not too many right, though, but boring otherwise. Don't want that. Right, for our question six, I am really, really delighted to pass over to our first celebrity guest host. This is uh, Eamon Elliott, and he is going to be joining us for our question six, so please tune in here. Hello, my name is Eamon Elliott. You may know me from TV shows like Threesome, Game of Thrones, and most recently Guilt, and movies like Prometheus, Star Wars, and Filth. Um, Thank you for supporting Into University and the incredible work that they do. My question is, what year was Netflix created? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Iman. What year was Netflix created? So, we're giving you a bit of leeway here. It's plus or minus one year. So, plus or minus one year either side. What year was Netflix created? A service that has changed massively since its inception. It's very, very weird to begin with. But what year was Netflix first created? That is question six. Thank you so much, Iman, for coming in and helping us with this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we really appreciate all of you guys for joining in this evening as well. And thank you so much for your donations we've had so far. We're doing really, really well with our target. And I'll be giving you some updates throughout the quiz as well. So we'll let you know how it's going. But thank you very much, Iman. That was question six. In what year was Netflix founded? Plus or minus one year either side as well. So don't have to give a, don't give a range of answers. That'd be weird. Don't give an uncertainty in interval or anything like that. Just, just, just give a year. But it's okay if you're one off. Thank you. Question seven. Question seven, which British airline collapsed in March this year? Which British airline collapsed in March this year? And my goodness, I bet the administrators are glad that it collapsed in March rather than giving them the, the unpleasant job of having to stop it from collapsing in April, because I'm sure it would have collapsed in April if it managed to make it through March. Which British airline collapsed in March this year? Question seven. Question eight. I got terribly excited when I saw this. Question eight. Which London Underground line has the most stations? I'm really, really cool. I just love the London Underground. I find it so interesting. I've been trying to think of trivia to, to say about this question, and I could just be here all night. We could carry on till nine just talking about this. Which London Underground line has the most stations? Uh, tell you what, put this in the comments. Which is if, Also, if anyone else can tell me which London station has the shortest escalator, put it in the comments. Um, what percentage of the underground is actually underground? Give me to the nearest 5%, less than you'd think. Uh, and apparently, when I was looking up some, some facts to go behind this, apparently the fastest line is the Metropolitan Line. Not that you'd know. I've been on the Metropolitan Line loads of times. 
It is never reaching the destination I think it's going to reach in the time it's meant to. Apparently, it can get up to 60 miles an hour. Never personally seen that myself. Certainly, the trains never stop when they seem to do that. Anyway, which London Underground line has the most stations? I'm clearly venting a lot of suppressed rage about the London Underground. But I can, because I don't need it anymore, because I can't go anywhere. So now, now, I can, now I can be mean about it, because I don't worry about upsetting it and making it turn away from me. Question eight. Which London Underground line has the most stations? Question eight. Question nine. What is the lowest scoring tile in Scrabble? What is the lowest scoring tile in Scrabble? So if you were to place this in a word, what would the score be for this individual tile? Now, I was doing some reading today and I found out that the uh, what's thought to be, and obviously it's an estimate, but what's thought to be the most likely seven letter word you can have in Scrabble is the word Eterio. Now, I might have mispronounced that, E-T-A-E-R-I-O, but this is this is a, a tip for any of you Scrabble fans out there, which is mostly me, it's just useful for me to know this, because somebody doesn't like me beating them at Scrabble. Uh, but Eterio is the most likely combination of seven letters you can have, and so is the most useful seven-letter word, is the most likely one you're going to have. And incidentally, it means the uh, clusters of fruit you get in, like a raspberry or a blackberry, the little kind of um, blobs. Blobs, balls, spheres. Spheroids of fruit is one of those. That's an etario. But apparently the most likely uh, combination of seven letters you can get. Question nine. What is the lowest scoring tile in Scrabble? Question nine. And finally, question ten. The last question of the general knowledge round. There are only three countries in the world where Coca-Cola is not the most sold drink. Scotland, North Korea... And which other country? We can guess why Scotland doesn't. We all know what they like to drink in Scotland. It's not bad. I don't, I don't mind it. But Scotland, North Korea, and which other country? I really like this question. I think it's really cool. I had to really think about this. There are only three countries in the world where Coca-Cola is not the most sold drink. Scotland, North Korea, and which other country? I wondered for a time whether the drink that was the one that was most sold was Fanta. Fanta, of course, being famously invented in World War II when German uh, German drinks factories ran out of supplies because of blockades of Germany and they had to invent Fanta based on just what they could find. They couldn't make Coca-Cola, so they tried making Fanta and it ended up being a really popular drink. The only the only drink we can thank World War II Germany for, apparently, is, is, is Fanta. But there we are. Uh, which other country other than Scotland and North Korea does not have Coca-Cola as its most popular sold drink? That's question 10, and that is the end of the general knowledge round. Um, I will um, I will do a very, very quick recap of all the questions in the general knowledge round. I will go through them pretty speedily, though, uh, just because I don't want to take make it take too long. I'll do a very quick run through, and then we'll move on to the next round. So question 10 was there are only three countries in the world where Coca-Cola is not the most sold drink, Scotland, North Korea, and where? Question 9 was what is the lowest scoring tile in Scrabble? Question eight was which London underground state uh, line has the most stations? So not necessarily the longest, but which has the most stations on it? That's question eight. Which London underground line has the most stations? Question seven, which British airline collapsed in March this year? Question six was uh, Eamon Elliott asking us uh, in what year was Netflix founded? And you can have plus or minus one year for that. Question five, in the 2019 New Year's Honours list, which famous author was recognised for his fantasy trilogy adapted by the BBC last year? That's question five. Question four is what do the numbers add up to on the opposite sides of a dice? Question three is which zodiac sign is represented by this animal, this animal being a goat? Question two was which city is said to have been founded by Romulus and Remus? And question one was the ruby anniversary marks what year of marriage? That's the general knowledge round. I've recapped the questions. So you've got no excuses now if you miss them. You've had, you've had them. I've repeated them so many times. There's 40 questions now I've said all over again. So that was general knowledge. And we're now going to move on to our sports round. These are some sporting things. If you didn't know what they were, there's some basketballs and some footballs. And what I thought originally were sausages, but apparently they're, they're, little, they're little dumbbells. But I, I, I thought they looked a bit like sausages myself. But maybe I have a weird impression of what sausages look like. Um... Just wanted to stop you and say thank you again uh, for all the great donations we've been having. We've seen so much generosity from donors this evening. We're really, really grateful for everything you can contribute. Even if it's just five pounds per person from people playing this quiz, it really makes a massive difference to supporting our young people. We're getting closer and closer to our £5,000 target this evening. We're really, really grateful for everything you can give. So thank you very much. And please, please do keep donating. So on to the sports round. Here we go with question one. 
Who was Liverpool Football Club's captain in their 2005 European Champions League triumph? Now, anyone who knows me knows that my uh, trivia knowledge does start to dip a little bit, just, just a little bit when it comes to sport. Um, so I'm going to try and remain interesting, but it might just be uh, embarrassing stories of when I've completely failed to do sporting events in my life. Uh, I really don't know anything about football. I know more about it now than I ever did, thanks to a dear friend of mine, but not as much as I probably should. But who was Liverpool Football Club's captain in their 2005 European Champions League triumph? I was really worried about a lot of these questions about me accidentally giving the answer away because, you know, I gabble quite a lot. I can be quite, you know, I'm very talkative and I was worried if I'm one of the other questions I might say, oh, give away an answer by accident. No chance here. No chance. I have no idea. No idea. I couldn't even tell you Liverpool Football Club's captain at the moment. Question two. Which four-time Olympic gold medalist stands at just four foot eight inches? Which four-time Olympic gold medalist stands at just four foot eight inches? This is a really inspirational question for me. It's so good to see that height makes no difference to performance at the Olympics because that really inspires me because now I know that it's just lack of talent that is stopping me from getting anywhere at the Olympics um, and I know that my height's not getting in the way. Um, I did try when I was at school, I had to do high jump and I was terrified of it. I was really bad at high jump and I had to clear, the bar was really, really high and I had to clear it and I, I flung myself over it with both legs at once and I was really happy because the teacher said, oh, Adam, you cleared it. Um, I didn't notice I cleared it because I smacked myself in the face with both my knees at the same time. So that, that's as close as I've ever gotten to, to achieving something in, in, in gymnastics or anything like that or, or jumping. So um, I think I'm going to leave it at that from there on. But question two, which four-time Olympic gold medalist stands at just four foot eight inches? Question three, which England rugby union player holds the record for the most points scored in rugby World Cups? Which England rugby union player holds the record for the most points scored in Rugby World Cups? That is question three. Just be moving on to question four. I'll give you guys an update on our funding target very soon as well, because I've been getting updates from my support team. In which decade was the first modern Olympics held? So this was obviously after the Olympics were held in ancient Greece and after they were banned by a uh, Christian Byzantine Empire. Which decade was the first modern Olympics held? I do use modern in pretty big quotation marks here. Let's not forget that up until 1948, they did give an Olympic medal for town planning. Really, they did. Uh, but that does fall under the definition of modern as far as it goes here. In which decade were the first modern Olympic Games held? Question four. And now for question five, I am so, so excited to get to introduce our second guest questioner of the evening. Uh, he is Radio One's breakfast presenter. He is Greg James. It's very much my pleasure to hand it over to Greg now. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. Hello and welcome to the Into University Quiz. This is Greg James. Uh, it's Thursday night. I don't have to get up tomorrow. I have been on the wine since 2 p.m. Um, pandemic, isn't it? So, my good friend Josh Shreve um, has been in touch to say uh, that I was required to do a question on the quiz, which I'm very pleased to do, particularly as it's a cricket question. So, here's my question to you, quizzers. Please name me the two English batsmen who went out to bat for the Super Over in the World Cup final last summer, which seems like so long ago. Um, that's the question, okay? Answer to follow. Thank you very, very much, Greg. Very, very grateful for Greg taking time out of his clearly extremely busy day there to ask us that question. Which two English batsmen went out to bat at the Super Over at the uh, event last year? Please uh, note that for this one, we're offering a point per answer. I think I think it's half a point per answer, to be precise, sorry. Um, so yeah, don't need to get both of them to get any points at all, but uh, half a point per answer. Question six. Question six, what is the name of Ireland's national sport pictured on the right? This is, to be clear, the Republic of Ireland, uh, not Northern Ireland. I don't know what their national sport is, but it may well be this as well. Who knows? That might be a coincidence. Uh, but what is this sport, which is the national sport of the Republic of Ireland? Question six. 
Question seven. Which nation have won the most women's football World Cup titles? Question seven. Which nation have won the most women's football World Cup titles? I'll just give everyone a moment to catch up there because I can give you an update on our um, our funding target. We are currently at £3,959, which is absolutely amazing, guys. It's only 26 minutes past eight and we're already doing so, so well. I'm really, really grateful. We're, everyone at Inter University is so grateful for the generous donations we're receiving tonight. Please do, please do keep them coming. We are so grateful because every every penny we get goes such a long way towards helping one of our young people at a time like this. It's such a difficult time for our young people. It's such a time for people who are who are vulnerable both in education and in other ways. And the support we can provide is really, really helping those people. So the donations we're getting do make a difference. It does help so much. Thank you so much for donating. We really appreciate it. 3,959 at last count. So thank you, we are getting really, really close to that 5,000 pound target. So do please keep up the donations. Okay, time for question eight. Which British pair are the highest scoring figure skaters of all time winning gold at the 1984 Winter Olympics? Now, I know for Greg James's question, I said you get half a point for each name. If you don't, if you know one of these two and you don't know the other, then you need to sell that cave you've been living in for the last 20 years because you either know none or you know both. So you have to get both of them for this one. Which British pair are the highest scoring figure skaters of all time winning gold at the 1984 Winter Olympics? That's question eight. And question nine, which heavyweight boxer is nicknamed the Gypsy King? The Gypsy King is the nickname of which heavyweight boxer? I don't know if that's the nickname you'd give him to his face. Uh, but which heavyweight boxer is nicknamed the Gypsy King? Question nine. And finally, question ten, the last question of the sports round. Beecher's Brook, the chair and the canal turn are all part of which sporting event? That's Beecher's Brook, the chair and the canal turn are all part of which sporting event? Great, so that is question 10. That's the end of the sports round. I will go and uh, uh, summarise and repeat the sports questions. I'll go through them quite quickly um, and then we'll move on to the next round. So I'll go, you should spice things up, keep things exciting for us. I'll start from question one this time rather than going backwards because anything goes, who cares? Oh, how exciting. Question one, who was Liverpool Football Club's captain in their 2005 European Champions League triumph? So that was who was Liverpool Football Club's captain in their 2005 European Champions League triumph? Question two, which four-time Olympic gold medalist stands at just four foot eight inches? Which four-time Olympic gold medalist stands at just four foot eight inches? Question three, which England rugby union player holds the record for the most points scored in rugby World Cups? Apparently this player scored 277 points across four World Cups. Obviously that's a lot because they hold the record, but I, I wouldn't know. Might be, might, that might be tiny for all I know, but apparently it's really good. Which England rugby union player holds the record for the most points scored in rugby World Cups? That's question three. Question four, in which decade were the first modern Olympics held? That's question four. Question five, I won't replay the video, but which two English batsmen went out to face the Super Over last year at the Cricket Cup? That's Greg James's question from question five. Question six, what is the name of Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland's national sport? Pictured here in the slide. What is the name of the Republic of Ireland's national sport? Question seven, which nation have won the most Women's Football Cup titles? That's question seven. And question eight, which British pair are the highest scoring figure skaters of all time, winning gold at the 1984 Winter Olympics? And like I said, for Greg James's question, question five, you uh, don't need to give both to get points. Obviously, give both if you know them. But for question eight, you do need both names to get the points on this one. That's question eight. Question nine, which heavyweight boxer is nicknamed the Gypsy King? Question nine. And finally, question ten, Beecher's Brook, the chair and the canal turn are all part of which sporting event? That's the sports round. You've had plenty of time now to finish the answers, so we are going to move on to our next round. Um, I will uh, give a recap. There is a going to be an interval, a short interval, five to ten minutes after round three. So you'll have a chance to uh, go make a cup of tea, review your answers, uh, do whatever you want to do uh, after question after round three. 
So that was the sports round, and next up is our entertainment round. Everybody ready? Fingers on buzzers. Won't be very helpful because I won't be able to hear you, but be ready. Question one. Which 1999 film was based on Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew? I was very disappointed when I saw that play. I really like shrews. Not even a sign of shrews being in it. It's a very, very misleading title. But which 1999 film is based on Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew? Lots of films, of course, have been based on Shakespeare plays. The Lion King, famously based on Hamlet, and uh, Romeo and Juliet, famously inspiring The Lion King's excellent, deeply underrated sequel, The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. Real shame it went straight to video. Really underrated film. But Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet being that one. But which film in 1999 was based on Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew? Question one. Question two. Which American female singer's name is an anagram of Presbyterians? Which American female singer's name is an anagram of Presbyterians? Question two. And for question three, I am really excited to get to hand over to the fantastic, brilliant Maisie Williams, who has very kindly helped us out by supplying a question for the entertainment round. So over to Maisie with her question. Hi everyone, it's Maisie Williams here. Thank you so much for participating in this quiz for Into University. And now for my question. I played Arya Stark on Game of Thrones and for a period of time in season one, she lived in King's Landing before fleeing after her father Ned was beheaded for treason. But can you tell me where King's Landing was filmed? Thank you so much, Maisie. So our question for question three, where was King's Landing the location King's Landing for Game of Thrones filmed. Now, to be specific, we want the city here, not the country or the region. We want the city that was the predominant location for King's Landing in Game of Thrones. Thank you very much, Maisie Williams. Question four. The release of which movie in 1973 led to a dramatic drop in the popularity of the Ouija board as a board game? It may come as a surprise to some that the Ouija board actually was a board game, but it had it had a patent from the same people as Monopoly, I believe. I think it was the Waddington brothers. Um, well, maybe that's a risk. Anyway, it was a board game. People played it as a board game, uh, and only, I think, about 40% of people who played it said they were trying to talk to the dead. The rest of them were just, I don't know, killing time before, before, uh, before Skype was invented. But in 1973, a movie was released that led to a very, very precipitous drop in the popularity of this board game. What was the movie? 1973 board game, uh, 1973 movie that killed off the popularity of the Ouija board as a board game, and now relegates it to cheap cameos in worse horror, uh, worse worse movies. Question five: Which TV show does this logo belong to? Which TV show does this logo belong to? Obviously, the blue bar is not part of the logo. We've put that on because you'd be able to see what the TV show was otherwise. Um, but which TV show does this logo belong to? Question five. Question six. Old Deuteronomy, McCavity and Bustaford Jones are all characters from which musical? Old Deuteronomy, McCavity and Bustaford Jones are all characters from which musical? Question six. Question seven. Who is Reg Dwight better known as? Reg Dwight is better known by what stage name? I love stage names. I always think they're really fun. It always disappoints me, though, when I realise that it's not the actual person's name. When I learnt that, Mor uh, that Michael Caine is really called Morris Micklewhite, it, was, it, was, it just blew my mind. It shattered the whole, whole pretense I had that he was born with this really cool name. Um, and fun fact about Morris Micklewhite is that in the excellent movie A Muppet Christmas Carol, you can see a shop which is called Micklewhite's, which is a reference to Michael Caine, who is, of course, playing Ebenezer Scrooge at the time. But question seven, who is Reg Dwight better known as? Question seven. Question eight, who is the only woman to have won an Oscar for best director for her film, The Hurt Locker? The only woman to have won an Oscar for best director for her film, The Hurt Locker. I do recommend this film uh, if you feel like you're having a really relaxed evening and, you know, you feel like your blood pressure's not really high enough, your heart rate's not high enough, and you just want to feel a bit stressed and uncomfortable, then really recommend The Hurt Locker. Great movie for just essentially putting anyone on edge. Um, genuinely really good movie. Won an Oscar, so obviously. Um, but yeah, who is the only woman to have won an Oscar for Best Director for her film, The Hurt Locker? 
very depressingly, only five women have ever been nominated, apparently, for, for an Oscar. Only five women have ever been nominated for Best Director, uh, for, for the Best Director Oscar. So something that clearly Hollywood needs to do something about. Question eight. And now question nine. Which female artist's Glastonbury performance is the most watched on TV, garnering an audience of 3.2 million people? 3.2 million people watched which female artist's Glastonbury performance? course topped now by Boris Johnson's coronavirus addresses now the most popular thing on TV clearly they're gonna you know snowball and become a a big media thing and of themselves maybe next year we'll get coronavirus briefings at Glastonbury that would really really make it so much more exciting in my opinion so there we go which female artist's Glastonbury performance is the most watched on TV garnering an audience of 3.2 million people and I just saw that somebody liked the Michael Caine fact as well that's really nice please do like that here all the time Literally all the time. Never leave. Question 10. Who has replaced Sandy Toxfig as the presenter of the Great British Bake Off to be alongside Noel Fielding? Who has replaced Sandy Toxfig as presenter of the Great British Bake Off presenting alongside Noel Fielding? That was question 10. I will, of course, go back and repeat the previous questions so everyone has a chance to catch up if they've missed any. Starting back with question 1. So question one of the entertainment round was which 1999 film was based on Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew? Which 1999 film was based on Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew? Question one. Question two. Which American female singer's name is an anagram of Presbyterians? Which anagram, uh, which American female singer's name is an anagram of Presbyterians? I rather wanted this to be a question about um, the ex-Conservative Minister Virginia Bottomley, because her name anagramizes to I'm an evil Tory bigot, which I thought was much funnier, but uh, probably not uh, as, as neat a quiz question. Um, so in this case, which American female singer's name is an anagram of Presbyterians? Question three. Question three was Maisie Williams asking us in which city was King's Landing filmed in Game of Thrones? So in the Game of Thrones TV show, which city served as the filming location for King's Landing? Question three. Question four, the release of which movie in 1973 led to a dramatic drop in the popularity of Ouija boards as a board game? Question four. Question five, which TV show logo, uh, sorry, which TV show does this logo belong to? Which TV show does this logo belong to? That's question five. Question six, old Deuteronomy, McCavity and Bustopher Jones are all characters from which musical? Old Deuteronomy, McCavity, and Buster for Jones are characters from which musical? Question seven, who is Reg Dwight better known as? Reg Dwight, not the character from The Office, that's Dwight Schrute, but which person is better known by their stage name and they're actually called Reg Dwight? Question seven. Question eight, who is the only woman to have won an Oscar for Best Director with her film, The Hurt Locker? Question eight. Question nine, which female artist's Glastonbury performance is the most watched on TV, garnering an audience of 3.2 million people? And finally, question 10, who has replaced Sandy Toxfig as presenter of the Great British Bake Off to be alongside Noel Fielding? And that's the end of the entertainment round, guys. We are now on a short break. I will come back to you very soon with a update for the fundraising target. And I'm really, really delighted to say £4,100 is our current level. And that is so exciting because only 10 minutes ago did I say we were on 3,959 and we are making such great progress. I wish I could make that much money in that much time. Normally, that's really, really great. You guys are being so generous. We're so grateful for all the donations you're making. Please do keep it up. It would be so amazing if we can make it to that £5,000 target. Every penny really does go such a long way to helping our young people. Um, We're on a break now, though, so please do grab yourself uh, a cup of tea. We'll restart at quarter to nine. So currently, on my according to my watch, it's 2040. So we will restart at 8.45, quarter to nine, and uh, resume the quiz then. In the meantime, you'll have my company. Lucky you. My partner's been having it nonstop for five weeks, so it's probably about time somebody else got got, uh, got subjected to it instead. <sighs> really, really excited to be doing this, by the way. It's been so much fun to be writing this quiz and putting it together and uh, 
Rebecca Marsh and Anna Milne have done such a fantastic job putting it all together because this was this was all very much their idea, and I've I've just been brought along to be be the face of things, which is very very nice that they wanted me to do it. So it's a huge amount of fun for me, but they've done really such an amazing job. So uh, a big hand to them; they've been absolutely fantastic. And as have all of you for tuning in and watching. It's so exciting to have everybody here and so great to have so many of your generous donations coming through. We're really, really grateful for them. Inch University has been, like I said earlier, supporting um, more than 2,500 people, uh, making 2,500 calls every week. Uh, in the last few weeks during the lockdown, supporting our students with pastoral support, with academic work. We've been sending out regular projects and newsletters to both our younger students and to our older students. We've been opening up our support out of hours to our secondary students as well, uh, because we know what a difficult time this is for them. We are supporting our students with online learning platforms. We have our own bespoke online learning experience that our primary students can use to carry on their curriculum that we would normally deliver during academic support. We deliver a degree topic themed academic curriculum for our primary school students every term at academic support. Um, and we're not going to let something like this stop us from doing that. So we are carrying on with all of that support and uh, every penny that we get from tonight is going to make such a difference as well. So we really do appreciate it. Oh. Hope everyone's well though. Hope everyone's enjoying themselves. Hope everyone is going to take the opportunity to go and have, go and get a drink, go and have a cup of coffee or a biscuit or a cup of tea or something else, given that it's, you know, it's nearly, nearly nine o'clock, so you can have something nice. It is Wednesday, so, you know, tone it down. But it is, it is a bit of a, a bit of a grim evening, so I'd, I'd be in the mood for something cosy, I think. I can't really get up and make a hot chocolate right now. It's a bit, bit of a tight squeeze, but it's, I just, just imagine I've got one here instead. I'm not doing as well as our squirrel. We've got a, we've got a lovely garden that we we've been very lucky to have recently, um, but we're being taunted by a squirrel who spent last summer stealing our tomatoes, and just today we saw him running across the fence with a pan of chocolat. It's just a whole pastry, not a bit of one, a whole pastry. He's ran across the fence with it in his hands, looking very proud of himself. And I I thought I'd made a mistake or something and hadn't noticed, and it had been like a twig or something like that. But he he had a pan of chocolat. And I sort of looked and I said to my partner, oh, look, there's a squirrel with the pound chocolate again, because she saw him pull it out of a bin a few months ago. And then I looked back a few minutes later, he had another one. It's ridiculous. So, yeah, he's doing well, at least. He's doing well. He's got more, he's had more pastry than I've had today. So, you know, good for him, I suppose. He's enterprising, but <sighs> he's very annoying, that squirrel. He, he eats our tomatoes and then he just throws them away. He eats half and then throws it away. He's made eye contact with me once when he was doing that made direct eye contact and just looked at me ate the tomato and chucked it so you know he's malicious he's enterprising but he's malicious he, he sets out to be upsetting but oh well back to something positive four thousand one hundred pounds our target uh progress so far so so good we're doing so well please keep that up guys for the remainder of the evening we will be hitting five thousand and it's so exciting we're really really grateful for all of your generous donations it's so wonderful to be getting uh, so much support from everybody at such a difficult time like this. So thank you so much for that. We really, really do appreciate it. Cool. It will be 8.45 very shortly, so we will be restarting quite soon. Eight forty-four. Just get myself ready. Looking at some of the very lovely comments people are sending in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being so nice. Uh, wasn't as nervous as I thought I'd be doing this, but it's uh, it's lovely to hear everyone sending in such nice messages. Um, this is the most smartly dressed I've had to be for weeks. I'm really glad I can still fit into all of this because there was a chance I might not have been able to. But it's it's good. I'm still able to wear clothes and you know I have new holes to put my arms in and everything. So that seems to be OK so far. Oh, oh yeah, and I almost forgot a very, very happy birthday to Scarlett Furlong for tomorrow if you're watching this. Thank you so much for joining in and a very happy birthday for everybody at Inter University. And indeed, if it's anybody's birthday today, this week, tomorrow, or, you know, any time in the year, happy birthday from everyone at Inter University. Hope you have a lovely day. Oh, get why radio presenters like doing this now. It's just so, so, so heartwarming, isn't it, to say that? Cool, so... I think it's 8.45. I think it's time to resume. We're going to carry on. And we're going to be moving on to round four. So sit back on your sofa, sit back at the desk, get your cup of coffee, get your cup of tea. Carry on and get ready for this bit of the quiz. The geography round. My favourite round, the most exciting round. Coming to you from lovely 
Well, I've lovely Wilsdon Green, but Wilsdon Green at the very least. And the geography round coming next, my favourite part. Here we go. Which European country's name translates literally as Black Mountain? So if you were to transliterate this name into English from its uh, linguistic root, you would get the name Black Mountain. But my question to you is which European country is this referring to? Uh, maybe as a slight clue, there is a US state whose name translates in a similar fashion to Green Mountain. So if you know that, maybe this will help. But which European country's name translates literally as Black Mountain? Question two. Only one flag in the world is neither rectangular nor square. And to which country does it belong? Now, again, for the pedants out there, I'm sure there are plenty of flags that are funny shapes, but which national flag am I referring to? Because one national flag is neither a square nor a rectangle. To which country does that national flag belong? So, you know, if you've got a flag for your house and it happens to be in the shape of a triangle or a sausage, uh, that doesn't count. It's got to be a national flag. You can't then declare your house a country to do so. So which national flag is neither a rectangle nor a square? Question two. Question three. What links Istanbul, Mumbai and New York? What specific thing links Istanbul, Mumbai and New York? Question three. Question four, how many ceremonial counties are there in England? Now, again, this is one of those questions we've got to be really specific about because there's going to be someone out there going, oh, I think you know it's a district county council. No, it's a ceremonial county. How many of them are there in England? They're sometimes referred to as lieutenancy counties. They're not equivalent to county councils, though most county councils will also be from a ceremonial county. How many are there in England? And you get plus or minus five either way here. So definitely worth taking a punt on this one. Plus or minus five, either way, for ceremonial counties. Question four. And just England, not the whole of the UK, just England. Question five. Which European capital is situated on 14 separate islands? 14 separate islands. Which European capital is situated on 14 separate islands? Question five. Keeps happening. Question six. What is the southernmost capital city in the world? What is the southernmost capital city in the world? Question six. Question seven. How many time zones are there in Russia? Russia has a very many time zones compared to obviously many smaller countries. Uh, how many time zones does Russia have? They're obviously meant to reflect changes in latitude across the planet. But in fact, all they do in, is end up reflecting cultural borders most of the time because China only has one and it's enormous. But Russia follows a slightly different pattern and has some time zones, how many does it have? How many time zones are there in Russia? Question seven. Question eight, there are four countries in the world that contain only one vowel. Can you name any one of those four? Now, again, requires a bit of clarification perhaps. I'm not referring to countries that contain one repeated vowel like Canada or Fiji, answer in the comments if you can think of any others, kids, but a single vowel anywhere in the name, just the one vowel, Four countries have only one. Can you name one of those four that has only a single vowel in its name? Question eight. Question nine. Which stretch of water separates the Isle of Wight from mainland Britain? Which stretch of water separates the Isle of Wight from mainland Britain? Uh, I thoroughly recommend taking the hovercraft from Portsmouth to Ride, by the way. It's a very, very entertaining ride to go from. <laughs> ride. Uh, which stretch of water separates the Isle of Wight from mainland Britain? Question nine. I will be repeating the geography round as well, so don't worry, we'll be going back through it. Question ten. Which island in the Arctic Ocean is the largest in the world? Which island in the Arctic Ocean is the largest in the world? That's question ten. Uh, that's the geography round. I will go over them again for everyone. So, going back through the geography round. Question one. Which European country's name translates literally as Black Mountain? Which European country's name translates literally as Black Mountain? That's question one. Question two, only one flag in the world is neither rectangular nor square. To which country does it belong? So one country's flag is neither rectangular nor square. 
Which country does that flag belong to? Question two. Question three. What links Istanbul, Mumbai and New York? It's question three. What links Istanbul, Mumbai and New York? Question four is how many ceremonial counties are there in England? So just England and ceremonial counties or lieutenancies, as they're sometimes known. How many ceremonial counties are there in England? Question five, which European capital is situated on 14 separate islands? Which European capital is situated on 14 separate islands? Question six, what is the southernmost capital city in the world? So which capital city is located as far south as south can go when it comes to capital cities? Question seven, how many time zones are there in Russia? How many time zones are there in Russia? Question seven. Question eight, there are Four countries in the world that contain only one vowel, a single vowel, not repeated vowels, like I said before, so not repeated vowels, one vowel, can you name one of them? So four countries in the world that contain only one vowel, can you name one? Question nine, which stretch of water separates the Isle of Wight from mainland Britain? Which stretch of water separates the Isle of Wight from mainland Britain? That's question nine. And question 10, which island in the Arctic Ocean is the largest in the world? Which island in the Arctic Ocean is the largest in the world? Sorry if I went a bit fast on that round, by the way, guys. It is geography. I get very excited when I'm talking about geography. It's just so interesting. Question 10, which island in the Arctic Ocean is the largest in the world? That is question 10. I'm going to be moving over now to our final round. The linky round. So this round takes a little bit of explaining. The linky round has 10 questions like all the other rounds, but there is an overarching theme to the answers to these questions. And question 10 will be to identify that theme. So pay close attention to the answers and try and identify the theme from the, uh, try and identify the link between the different answers. We're nearly at the end of the quiz, by the way, guys. So thank you so much from uh, everybody at Inch University for everyone who's been donating. We really, really appreciate it. We've just hit £4,200. We are so, so close to getting to that target. Please do keep those donations coming. It's doing so well. We are so grateful for everybody's support. Really, really grateful indeed. Thank you so much. Carrying on now for the linky round. Question one. Here we go. Name the missing original Cluedo character. Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard, Mrs. White, Mrs. Peacock and Reverend Green. Now, I am aware that there was a rebrand recently of Cluedo where they uh, swapped out a character for a new one. The new one, I believe, is Dr. Orchid. Not interested in Dr. Orchid, like the question says, missing original Cluedo character, please. Dr. Orchid may be cool, but I want the original missing character from the list you see before you. So Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard, Mrs. White, Mrs. Peacock, Reverend Green, who is missing? Question one. And remember, there is a connecting theme to all of these answers. So keep an eye on your answers and put together the theme as it comes out. Question two, a hilarious bit of ancient history for everybody. The idea that all people are connected uh, by six or fewer social connections away from each other is called what? The idea that all people are six or fewer social connections away from each other is called what? Of course, we're not connected by social connections at all anymore. We're all just stuck in our houses. But in the olden days when we were allowed outside, there was an idea that all people were six or fewer social connections away from each other. What was that idea called? Question two. What major sporting championship takes place at the August National Golf Club where the winner receives a green blazer? That is question three. 
What major sporting championship takes place at the August National Golf Club where the winner receives a green blazer? Question three. Question four, who is Gavin Williamson? Gavin Williamson, who is he? Uh, specifically, I want to know what is his job? What does Gavin Williamson do? Oh, I do apologise. I've just been told that there was a mistake in question three. I'll just go back to it. It's Augusta National Golf Club, not August. Augusta National Golf Club, uh, which is the state capital of Maine, I believe. So maybe that's where it is. Uh, August, Augusta National Golf Club where the winner receives a green blazer. What's the major sporting championship that takes place at Augusta National Golf Club? Thank you very much for uh, spotting that mistake. Uh, question four, like I said, was who is Gavin Williamson? Uh, and I said I wanted his job, so what job does Gavin Williamson do at the moment? Question five, what 1967 American film stars Dustin Hoffman as Benjamin Braddock? Benjamin Braddock is the character played by Dustin Hoffman in which 1967 American film? That's question five. And for question six, I'm delighted to introduce our fourth and final guest quizzer. Uh, very, very pleased to introduce Ian Wang, University Challenge Captain, for our final guest question. Take it away, Ian. Ah, oh, PowerPoint. Very, very trigger happy. Here we go. Hi, I'm Ian Wang. Uh, you may also know me as Grandmaster Wang. I was the captain of the University Challenge team from Corpus Christi College, Cambridge. Uh, and thank you for taking part in this quiz to help support and raise funds for Inter University, who are a really amazing charity. Um, my question for you is, where would you be able to find the Magna Carta, Jane Austen's desk, and the original manuscript version of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland? Thank you so much, Ian. So to repeat that question, where would you find the Magna Carta, or a copy of the Magna Carta, Jane Austen's desk, and the original manuscript for Alice in Wonderland? That was question six. Thank you very, very much, Ian Wang, for the final celebrity question. Question seven, who played Javert in the film adaptation of Les Miserables? So not the TV adaptation that came out a couple of years ago, but the film adaptation who played Javert in the film adaptation of Les Miserables? Question seven. Moving on now to question eight. Last couple of questions of the quiz. Please do keep those donations coming. We're so, so close to achieving that target. So please do continue. We are doing really, really well. And thank you so much already for all of your generosity. It really does make such a difference. Question eight, what part of the brain whose name is derived from the Latin for seahorse plays a key role in memory? What part of the brain whose name is derived from the Latin for seahorse plays a key role in memory? That's question eight. And now time for our penultimate question of the linky round and indeed of the quiz. Please name the longest running TV dating show in the US. Not the best TV dating show in the US. That, of course, would be Beauty and the Geek. Peerless, unmatched TV dating show in the US. Such a tragedy, it collapsed. All they had against it was horrible uh, stereotypes of female intelligence and toxic masculinity. But hey, what is the longest running TV dating show in the US? The longest running TV dating show in the US? Question nine. Finally, question 10. Please identify the link from the linky round. I will go over those questions again for everybody. What is the link? I'll go back to the beginning and we'll review the questions. Starting now. So, back to question one. Name the missing original Cluedo character. Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard, Mrs. White, Mrs. Peacock and Reverend Green. Who is missing from that original lineup? Name the missing original Cluedo character from this list. That's question one. Question two, the idea that all people are six or fewer social connections away from each other is called what? The idea that all people are six or fewer social connections away from each other is called what? That's question two. Question three, what major sporting championship takes place at the Augusta National Golf Club, 
where the winner receives a green blazer. What major sporting championship takes place at the Augusta National Golf Club, where the winner receives a green blazer? Question four, who is Gavin Williamson? What does he do for a job? What does he do for fun? I don't know what he does for fun. What is his job, Gavin Williamson? That's question four. Question five, what 1967 American film stars Dustin Hoffman as Benjamin Braddock? That's what 1967 American film stars Dustin Hoffman as Benjamin Braddock? Question six from the great Ian Wang was, where would you find the Magna Carta, Jane Austen's desk, and the original manuscript for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland? That's question six. Where would you find Jane Austen's desk, the Magna Carta, and the original manuscript for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland? Question seven. Who played Javert in the film adaptation of Les Miserables? Who played Javert in the film adaptation of Les Miserables? Question eight. What part of the brain, whose name is derived from the Latin for seahorse, plays a key role in memory? What part of the brain, whose name is derived from the Latin for seahorse, plays a key role in memory? That was question eight. Question nine, name the longest running TV dating show in the US. So what is the name of the longest running TV dating show in the US? That's question nine. And finally, question 10, what is the link? So identify that link, please. And that is your final question for the Linky Round, and indeed the final question of the quiz. Thank you so, so much for everyone taking part. Um, I will just wait for a uh, final update on our fundraising target um, before we finish off. Uh, it's been really, really fun having everybody here. Thank you so much to everyone who took part. It's been so great. It's been really, really fun doing this. Everyone gets to listen to me. What, what would I like less? It's brilliant. Wait, what could I like more? There we are. It wasn't a Freudian slip. It was really, really cool. Uh, £4,300 is currently the target we're sitting on. Obviously, this is not the only opportunity to donate. There will be plenty of time to make donations afterwards. And like I said at the start, this um, video will be uploaded straight to YouTube. So you will be able to watch it and submit answers up to the 5th of May, after which we will then be... Um, announcing the winner of the quiz. That's me finished here. I'm so, so grateful to everyone who's taken part and so, so grateful to everyone who has donated. Massive thanks also go to Anna Milne and Rebecca Marsh for putting this quiz together. They did such a fantastic job. And to Olivia Ronsley, who's also written questions for it. Um, massive, massive thanks to them. They did such a brilliant job. They've put so much hard work into this. It's been great. It's been so much fun.